and uh, we'll be off to the races. Cool. In three, two, one. Fantastic Pixel Castle and Frog Pants Studios presents Word on the Street with Greg Street and Scott Johnson. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Word on the Street. This is a monthly attempt to talk all about uh, Fantastic Pixel Castle's awesome new MMO coming out soon, codenamed currently Ghost. We still don't have a real name, but I think we're getting there. Maybe it'll stay mm -hmm. Ghost. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, but I'm Scott Johnson, your host, and I am joined today not by Greg Street. He is on a flight or somewhere in between or a, <laughs> something to that effect, going to Asia and doing some some moving and shaking as head of the studio. But instead, today, we have Brian Holinka joining us. That's right, the famous Holinka. You know him, you love him. Brian, hey. welcome to the show, man. How are you? Good, man. Awesome. Awesome to see you again and talk to you. It's been a while. It's been ages. But, I feel like it's yeah. been forever because... Uh, uh, well, probably at BlizzCon, the last time we physically saw each other. Yeah. And the yeah. last time I really talked to you in any kind of depth was, uh, you know, other than here and there on Twitter and stuff, was uh, you had a bee infestation thing a while back. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget oh, that. For whatever reason, I'm sure you'll never forget it, but for whatever reason, I think about that and you all the time. That, that uh, it, like, uh, I had a huge hive. I'll even tweet it out or something, but it was uh, just because I, I think I did it when it happened, but yeah. essentially uh, some bees came and created this massive hive under my roof yeah. and they get, they had to cut it open. They cut my roof open the square and there was just this, I mean, it was massive. I, I don't think anything but the pictures would do it justice. Just like how gigantic that hive was. Yeah. Uh, and you know, paid people to come take the hive out and save the bees and everything, which, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's just a funny, like, Oh hey, uh, you know, universe has decided you need to spend a thousand dollars to to do this now. It was kind of a crappy situation, but well, it was I, it was nuts. I'm just glad you didn't get swarmed or something weird like that. You know, that would have been better. one of the one of the freakiest parts about it was like when I had the removal people come. They had like this um, this heat gun mm. that like you know you point so that they could try to look at it. And so we're inside, and we're in my kid's bedroom, right above where my son like sleeps and they like point the gun up at the ceiling and it like turns all red Ooh. and he's like oh and i was it's like i was in aliens or something and you know like they're in the <laughs> they're in the, they're in the uh, vents you know and uh so that was really creepy but anyway they got well, out. the good news the good news is is the ghost will feature no direct b combat because uh we right. don't want to put you through no, that we're, man. we're b phobics now yeah <laughs> the whole team <laughs> Um, I'm excited about this because, uh, well, a we're you know I've known you for a long time and and yeah. uh, it's always nice to talk to you, but also the fact that you're now uh, you know a big part of this project and have your fingers specifically in the combat and PvP cookie jars. Yep, uh, I think is going to be great today because I think a lot of people are curious about what the plans are or at least how things are going so far. Before we get to any of that stuff, though. Uh, yeah. You guys know Brian Holinka from a long run over at Blizzard, and for a long time of that, you were in charge of PvP in general. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That I think made you a little infamous uh, in the community, yeah. you know. Because if there's if there's one thing I can say, and it's true of PVE as well, but there are some yeah. rabid, very focused, interested fans when it comes to combat, PvP, balance, yeah. that kind of yeah. stuff. Um, do you want to say anything about that experience overall? Like, do, do you did that send you to this project with just a ton of learned examples or learned lessons that you can now sort of apply to Ghost? I mean, absolutely. I, it, but there's so many things <laughs> that I learned in in that decade. Yeah, like basically the first five years at Blizzard, I was just PvP, and then the second kind of tenure was um, working on class and and PvP, so both PVE and PvP class design. Uh, and and just leading up the team that honestly does such a great job uh, over there. Um, it's funny because I was thinking about that, and this kind of goes a little bit into this mission of being very transparent that um, uh, FPC has. Because when I first got to Blizzard, I was like, "Oh, this PvP community—they, you know, they are—they feel like they don't have a voice uh, mm -hmm. the, the talking to them." And so I'll try to do that for them. And so I went, I went hard uh, on that. And Greg was there at the time, right? And Greg was very active on Twitter. So I became very active on Twitter, started listening to podcasts. I had an hour commute to and from uh, work. 
And so I would listen to all the podcasts. I'd listen to yourself. I'd mm-hmm. listen to any any PvP one I could find. I would I would listen to um uh the Game Breaker back mm. in the time, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh and, and so I listened to a, a, and Josh and, and and folks um and my whole life at that time for like five years was just like wow mm. right just mm-hmm. like what is going on in the community like always looking at my Twitter seeing oh my god somebody's you know something's wrong mm. uh, every time there was an esports event um I was like tuned in that weekend and I had you know young kids my kids were like one and three at this time you know mm-hmm. basically from like the one to five years old stretch there sure and i i think i i i burnt i burnt myself out mm. like hardcore doing that and then part of that was just like i want to be you know i, I want to be out there for everybody and and feel like they're they're heard yeah and uh it, it did take a toll on me i think the the second round uh you know i took a year and worked on a, a project a shooter um project uh a starcraft shooter project and then i came and came back to wow and the second time i came back to wow i I took a much different approach um because it was it was a lot mentally uh and emotionally for me to 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 be that engaged all the time right yeah that's a part of the this business people don't talk about that much or or maybe we just assume it now or whatever it's just this different world we live in where everything is you know, microblogged or said or podcasted or videoed or whatever. Um, but the desire for the team, especially when you have a, a part of the, when you're on part of the team there where it's all about player engagement and, yeah. and knowing the ins and outs of where PV, PVP is or where combat changes are headed or whatever all that stuff may be, wanting to be as connected to what the community is thinking, saying, doing, and how they're playing, that must mm-hmm. be overwhelmingly uh not tempting is not the right word it's just you just feel like you have to engage in a way that maybe yeah, 20 and, years ago you didn't have to do that so much because you were just making something behind the scenes and eventually it would come out and people would be into yep. it or not and there didn't have this feedback loop so uh, you know one of the things i noticed that you did that i always wondered about and i promise everyone listening we are we are going to get to actual combat here in a minute yeah, yeah um but uh you did this thing on social media twitter it to be specific where one day I noticed all of your previous posts were gone. And then one time you talked about it, you said, I don't know if it was once a year or something, but you go in and you just do a wipe. Was that part of this to kind of just reset yourself, not be so, I don't know, to to reset some of the permanence of that? Like what, tell me just where your head was at, because I think it's interesting. My thought there was like, this happened like two or three times where it was just like, out of nowhere, someone would either reply to like a two-year-old tweet mm. or like bring it up kind of like, aha, gotcha. Yeah. You know, you said this three years ago and, you know, it's not the case now, five years later. Yeah. And I was just like, what are, what are we doing? Like, why? And I think Twitter, I, I actually really like Twitter for like engaging with people because of the character limit. Mm-hmm. it is hey you've got to be brief you want to talk you want to tell me something mm-hmm. there are six i sixty thousand people it's not a ton but there's sixty thousand people even i can't Im- imagine people who have a million followers but like if sixty thousand people want to talk to you you cannot read three pages from sixty thousand people right mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. so what's nice about twitter is like hey here's you know me just throwing something at you that's kind of short right and so i like twitter for that but i think there's that's good for like conversations that last two, three days, right? Like it doesn't have to be forever in right. my opinion. Right. So I was just like, there was a, there was a, a thing called tweet delete.net and I would just run it and it just automatically every two weeks would delete everything. I think it broke. I think uh, Elon broke it. Yeah. But um, <laughs> I just thought it was healthier to just be like, I really like the ability to talk to people but I don't really see the reason for that conversation to live forever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The ephemeral nature of what you did just got me rethinking the way I use social media. So uh, oh yeah, I haven't yeah. really done anything about it, but I appreciated the, uh, the way it made me rethink the way this stuff works. So yeah. Yeah. Cause it, I, I mean, it's great to have a conversation right now, mm-hmm. but you know, I don't, I don't know that everything I ever say needs to be recorded 
and and you know plus you know the games are different you know sure. and so i try to also i try as much as possible to only be positive on there like you know if i'm if i'm playing a game and i think it's rad then you know talk about that like you know sure. hey i'm having a great time with my son is you know having a great time with shadows of war we're playing hell divers like i think it's cool to just put that positivity out there but there's a lot of things I'd play or watch and I'm like, yeah, that sucked. And I don't feel obliged to be like, I'm going to go, you know, make sure everyone on the internet knows that I thought this thing sucked. Cause it's just like, I'm going to move on. So. Yeah. No, I totally get that. Well, uh, coming from obviously, uh, the wow team and the world's biggest MMO to a project like this with old friends and people you like and respect and have worked for, for uh, with and for before, uh, must be a really exciting thing. You have been tasked and correct any of this if I'm wrong, but sure, tasked sure. with like issues surrounding how is combat going to play out in this game? Mm -hmm. How is PvP going to get played out in this game? And we talked a little bit about lessons learned from WoW. We'll talk more about that as it needs uh, to come up and that sort of thing. But what is, if you can even articulate yeah. it, and you probably can, but what is the general philosophy around combat at this stage? Yeah, yep, sure. Yeah, we're, we're much more focused on combat at this time. Like I... PvP, for what it's worth, PvP is kind of like, a, yeah, we'll get to that yeah. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a bit. The, the phase we're in, and I'm sure they've talked about this, I know they talked about this previously, this prototype phase, it's like, hey, what, what are the questions that we ask that we cannot get answered any other way but to put it in code right now right. and play it ourselves? Sure. There, there may be things that we can point to in other games and say, that's how we want to do it, right? And or that's how we don't want to do it. And so there's no need to do everything. Let's just do the unanswered questions, right? And so for combat, you know, who is our core audience? Who's the main people that we're going to try to appeal to for this game, right? It's people who know Greg, yeah. who are fans of Greg, sure. uh, who are PC MMO players, right? And so the the balance we're trying to strike is create a game and combat that feels familiar to them that they're comfortable with they're, you know you, you can come into this game and be like all right i don't need to you know take a three-hour course on how to play the game like, i feel like that's so many games i've been playing lately uh the ones i get really drawn to are the ones i just i start like that prince of persia lost crown i just i was in it yep. right away yep. right hell divers you're just you're in it right yep. away yep. versus some other games where I've had to play and it's like, okay, let us run you through the tutorial of every little mechanic first and then set you out in the world. And so we want to be a game that people who love MMOs can come into the game and play it. And and so that's one thing. And those games are very approachable. Uh, part of our, one of our pillars is, is playing with your friends, right? It's, it's about going on, the game is about going on an adventure with your friends in these, these cool worlds. Like that's, the, the ethos of these games is you get together with people and you go on adventures. And part of that is making the the combat very approachable. Um, try to say the word approachable, not simple, yeah. uh, not easy, uh, uh, not necessarily accessible. We want it to be accessible. But what I'm talking about here is approachability, right? Mm -hmm. want people to be able to... I always talk about what I, I used to call the, the PATS test. Yeah. The idea being if the game was just there at like PAX East or PAX West, like gamers could come up and start playing it right away and feel comfortable mm. playing it versus, you know, I don't need my mother who's never played a game. I'm, I'm not the, trying to make the game that, you know, is making my 76 year old mother a gamer for the first time, right? <laughs> right? This is a game, it's a game for gamers that gamers of all types should be able to come and play. All right. Uh, so that's one thing. And then it's like, What's the new thing? What are the new things that we can bring to that experience, to to that familiar and approachable experience? And we're kind of looking towards a lot of action games, right? We're looking at, uh, like I mentioned, Assassin's Creed and Shadows of War and Batman and Spider-Man and, uh, you know, the, the, the Respawn Jedi Knight games and God of War and uh grand blue fantasy and the relink and and all these games that are more actiony mm. and visceral and have a lot of physical nature to the combat how do we what are the things like mechanics in each of those games that we can take that will work well 
in an MMO. Do you feel like uh, do you feel like you've MMO. got a higher ceiling too of of uh, possibilities here, given the engine you're working with? You know that you can get you know fluid action combat in a way that maybe they couldn't squeeze out of early engine WoW in 2003 or whatever. Oh, I, I mean, you know, that's that's the thing, right? Like technology has come real far. People are are very experienced now. I mean, first of all, WoW's combat is, is awesome, right? Like it it has for for even initially when it first came out, uh, it was great. It was fluid. It was responsive. You know, the way the global cooldown works, it gives time for animations to play out. Uh, when you press the button, things happen right away. Yeah. And then when the team revisited that in Legion, you know, they they just improved upon it even more in terms of um, uh, how you know they prioritize the animations, how. Uh, even floating combat techs work. So they do a really top-notch job there. And even when we were there, uh, I remember Jay Wilson was kind of working on that project and he was looking at Street Fighter 2, right? It was like mm -hmm. Street Fighter 2 is the genre leader in everything in terms of controls and and combat, right? And so very similarly, you have to, there, there are meta level things you have to do in terms of big mechanics. But then you have to really look at the, the the very small details of just there's a delay when we press the button. Why? Right. And what can we do on the client immediately? What do we have to wait for the server for? Um, and, and and those types of things. And, and what we call presentation, the effects, the animations, the sound, making that all top notch. Uh, you know, we have Graham Berger uh, on board who who was uh, the class. He was the class lead for evoker he worked on demon hunter he's just he is the dude mm. for making combat uh feel good through presentation uh and we're so lucky we have him on board and he's awesome so i think we're gonna we're gonna deliver on that i'm very confident actually in our ability to make button presses feel good i think what i'm less sure of right now is what are things like that we can actually pull from these action games and make work, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. in God of War, you do a combo and the third hit knocks the monster against the wall. Yeah. That would be pretty annoying if you're <laughs> yeah. playing with three other people, yeah. right? Oh yeah. So maybe that's one that doesn't work. Um, and so it's just really trying to, like the, the one that I think thus far that uh, just that we're going to try first, the one we're kind of trying now is, in a lot of these games, they, you know, they'll, they'll play an animation, they'll telegraph, the Y button appears over their head, you know, and you have this minute or this like half a second to press the button at the right time. And you kind of do a sync animation and then, you know, they're stunned or whatever. I think that could actually work um, pretty well and kind of bring a new element to it. Um, that's and just a, trying to find all those types of things. That's a really interesting point because um, as someone who's actually playing Grand Blue Fantasy Relink right now, uh -huh. um, I've had thoughts playing that game where I went, ooh, this would be good in an MMO. Like there's something right. about that game that feels yeah. MMO-ish. And you're right about some of these combat scenarios though where what's fun in a single player focused game and me knocking a guy way over there into a tree is not going right. to be the same if I'm grouping with five friends. So that being said... Is there a not a temptation, but a lot mm -hmm. of pieces like you've mentioned the core group is like PC MMO players that you're kind yeah. of making this game approachable to. Yeah. Uh, a lot of them are used to standing still and hitting keys right. one through seven in a yeah. certain order. And yeah. not so much moving around in big dynamic ways. In fact, sometimes you hear right. things like, Oh, I tried ESO, but it was too much moving around, or I I like uh, what's happening in Final Fantasy XIV, but it really wants you to get out of the way too much or or whatever. Um, that must be hard to find that balance to make combat fun, exciting, and dynamic, but also don't make it too fiddly for people. That's that's a big concern. I, we, we've talked about that a lot in terms of like having a dodge button, mm. right? Um, uh, a lot of like Guild Wars 2, I know, yeah, so they, they have rolls and dodges. And we were just having this conversation recently. And I think our, our strategy there is there are movement buttons like blinks and, and, and you know, uh, dashes and sprints, uh, fell rushes. Like, they are just intrinsically fun uh, yeah. buttons, right, to be yeah. able to kind of move around a little bit. And I think we want to provide that because it's just fun sure. uh, for people. But, yes, I have a lot of – I, I, I kind of call that – 
stand and deliver, right? When you when you actually bring somebody who's played a lot of action games and you bring them to play an MMO and they're doing a bunch of ranged attacks and then a bear runs up and hits their face and they just start backpedaling. Yeah. <laughs> like that's their instinct, right? Sure. And that is not really you're just, you know, if you're an experienced MMO player, you're like, no, nah, you should just you just gotta stand there and take it. And it's really about are your stats better than their stats? Are you doing your rotation faster than there? And then you'll you'll win. We're just talking about out in the world combat. So I am concerned about that. I feel like finding the right amount of movement um, that, uh, but the more you're moving, the less you're doing your abilities. You know, there there are a lot of people who start off playing MMOs and they're clicking all their spells and abilities, right? right. And and that gets them in. They're not immediately. The people who are mythic raiders, uh, even mythic raiders, like did not start off right away hitting all 20 buttons, right? Everybody grew into that. So some concerns about that. One of the things is the controller, right? Like we're, we're, well, like I said, our core audience is MMO players, the PC MMO players. But on the other hand, I watched my sons who, you know, they, I played a uh, while with them a little bit and my older one, he just took to it. No problem. But my younger one, he was just so used to gamepad yeah. that he became very frustrated and, and just didn't really want to learn the mouse and keyboard controls. Right. And I think for me, even when I was on wow, and now it was always like, this is such a cool, fun experience. I want to be able to play it on my couch right. with a controller. And, and so the thing about the controller is like, you know, there's only there's only so many buttons here. There's only so many things you can hit. And that sort of constrains the space, right? Of yeah, there you go. A lot of um, lot of shifting of, going on, right? You gotta use triggers to well, I know Final Fantasy 14 does this pretty well, actually. They've done a yeah. pretty good job with controller, partly because the game was co-developed for console as well. So they yep. were aiming for that to begin with. But yep. uh it's a lot of like you know, hold down left trigger to then make these face buttons be f four other options that didn't exist before. And yep. it does take some getting used to, but I, you know what? I mean, I'll just say it. And this is going to cause some people some real pain, but I kind of prefer this. I prefer yeah. having this little thing in my hand. Maybe it's because, yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I can't be hunched over a computer for 10 hours a day like I used to right. be able to. <laughs> I don't know. Well, and so that, so the thing is, well, on one hand, we're not, we're not leading our design with a controller, but like we're looking at it because it kind of sets the constraints. Like we were talking, I was talking to people today be, uh, the other because I was playing Hell Divers, and you played Hell Divers. Yeah, love it. It's Have great. You played it with a gamepad. Only only gamepad so far. In fact, I'm playing it on PC, but with gamepad, it's my preferred. Uh, my preferred. Okay, way. so I'm already started. Like I'm running away. I'm gonna reach my finger over to hit you know stem. Yeah. yeah. Or the, the the frustration, the very intentional. I think conflict they're creating in you can't move and do stratagems quickly very oh, no. easily like they don't yeah. want that to be a skill you develop right and so i had i I'd, I'd posted in one of our slacks like you know this even more makes me not want to want to put anything on the d-pad but i think what you could do is you played grand blue mm -hmm. right yeah, and, you know now. and a lot of games do this where they have like yeah press right bumper and then now the face buttons are four abilities i think wayfinder does that mm -hmm. grand blue fantasy does that uh, I think the, the Harry Potter game did stuff like that. So there's a lot of precedent for like hit a bumper, use the face button to cast a number of spells. I think in our game, um, you know, using D-pad to do cast time spells would be fine. Sure. Right. Sure. I'm, I'm going to take, I'm not going anywhere anyways. So for me to take my thumb off the, the left stick and press a D-pad button to cast a spell, that seems totally reasonable. Mm -hmm. I think what is bad is if you want to put any instant cast spells on that D pad, it's it's going to be bad. So mm. we're I think just kind of going back to the approachability question. I think one of the things we want to do is not have so many buttons. I think the controller kind of heads us in that direction. We'll probably have something along the lines of you know a, a core um you know uh like an attack and a special that you've kind of seen in a lot of action games that kind of loop but you know with with mmo resource models with abilities with cooldowns and, and other constraints uh those sorts of things will be in our class design and the idea that we want to have lots of classes lets us explore kind of varying degrees along the spectrum of like how approachable do we want it to be? Is there can there be some classes that are maybe a little trickier to play? 
um, there's a balance. There's always the balance question, right? Like yeah. as much as we want to act like uh, it's not a thing, players will have concerns about that. Um, but also, I think a start from starting from scratch approach here is, and it's it's almost a cursed problem. But how can we make you know throughput not always the solution? Like that's the the thing we've always we always talked about on WoW. It's the thing we I think you know starting from scratch that you want to do is how do you create worlds where it's not just always about did you hit all the buttons in perfect uh, sequence. Right. Um, there's going to be some amount of that. That's a bit of the mastery. Um, if you don't have aiming, if I'm not every second trying to put my crosshair on somebody's face, that's that's the micro skill that like you know shooters have. Sure. But in an MMO, it's well, how much of this can you manage? You know, how much of the environment, the encounter, that's what's going on. Can you manage that situation? Can you manage all your buttons, all your cooldowns, all your procs? Your ability to manage that situation is what, you know, separates people based on their ability to do that and 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 makes some people special, right? You, you got to sure. have the ability to have some skill expression. So sure, those when you have less of buttons, you have to say, well, if you're not managing thirty buttons and you're only managing ten, what are you fill? What are we filling their? their your know, headspace with otherwise what are they doing and part of that could just be shorter cooldowns part of that could be more movement um and that's the sort of stuff we're talking about is like how do we fill that void if we're not going to have all those those uh buttons to manage uh where are we going to re-emphasize and so there's a little bit on movement but back to your point that could turn off some people yeah oh yeah i mean you know these stories are long and wide from from warcraft experience where the team made, you know, trimmed or culled how many keys you could use or how many uh, abilities you had. And people complained. It was like, well, I liked having 400 things to do. And then when it gets to be too many people complain, well, that's too many things to do. I can't keep track of them all. Once again, it just sounds like this balance is a trick. It's hard, you know, yeah. to find the, yeah. to, to find the happiest place. I'm curious though, like, do you think that games like, well, souls likes have never been, bigger and they seem to only be getting bigger thanks to Elden Ring and you know big right. hits like that is that influencing any of this that particular genre do you guys are you aiming for any of that sort of deliberate moves unbreakable animation that end of things I mean it seems like it's its own genre for a reason but I'm curious yeah. if it's influencing what you guys are working on it uh, yeah I think it's it's more for us a direction we're not going like I think it's easier for us to identify that and say like yeah, uh, you know, the one of the first games I played when I started doing this job, it started looking at was like, oh, Monster Hunter. Like, oh, this yeah. seems really interesting. Like, it's multiplayer combat. Sure. Like, and what I learned was, oh, everything is super deliberate there, yeah. which is very appealing to them, uh, to to folks there. Um, it's uh very little. I mean, one of the things they're excellent at is their effect. They they do not have visual soup in that game. Right. Like right. what is most important is you can read the monsters tells and see what he's going to do. And I'm, I'm sure that's the same with the souls games. Right. So it's, it's very subtle effects and, and, uh, and visuals. So you could tell what everything's doing, but on the other hand, uh, that's just, I just, I don't think that's the direction we want to go. Right. We, we, because of the approachability standpoint, the ability for somebody to, hasn't played a lot of the game to come in and just perhaps just press attack and be able to kill the questing mob. Like that's okay. Right. We don't want that to be the strategy for the toughest challenges in the game, but we want somebody to come in and play the game with you. We want somebody to be able to tell a friend who's not familiar with these games. They come in, they have a good time, at least in the kind of questing and blue zone experience before really moving and leveling up and graduating to much more, um, difficult content so the the only thing that we've talked about with those games is largely around like a parry button do we want a parry button mm -hmm. i don't think so i yeah. think that we'll probably we're gonna have a counter button you know it would be like f on the keyboard or um you know triangle on the, <clears throat> the playstation controller uh and that's kind of a uh 
a button that we're going to have as kind of our reactive button. Mm. You could see it being that counter element I talked before, or you could think of the synergy attacks, the link attacks in uh, uh, Grand Blue. Oh, which, yeah, uh, I really like that. Which I think is a pretty cool idea, yeah. right? Of just like, hey, uh, your friend did something, press this button and you can join in with them, right? I think there's some cool opportunities to just remind you that you're fighting with friends there yeah um so i think we're gonna have that kind of button that is a very reactive press this button i'm so excited you're using that game as a as not as a template but as you're you're taking some things from it because i think it's excellent at that stuff like some of that stuff is so surprising to me how well it how well it plays and i've been playing a lot of those this year I i played a bunch of um tales of arise and just some other sort of grpg action titles and uh huh and that one just stands out as, I don't know, an example of a whole bunch of things. There are fights in that thing that feel like I'm doing an MMO fight with a bunch of people. Absolutely. And yeah. and it's a it's it's unique to the space in a in a way. Uh, most of those games don't do that very well, and this one does. Um, and they and they make a bunch of classes feel really good with very few buttons. Right. Right. Like right. they only have six buttons that they primarily use, and and the classes play pretty unique. And, and I think that's cool. I I. Every time a game like I, I play Tales of Arise or Grand Blue, and this is just like personal taste, but I'm always like, those visuals are awesome. I love it. The combat is really cool. But man, there's they they basically have like they either cast like Elmo or Shaquille O'Neal, <laughs> and that's it, right? Yeah. And and that's it. Those are the only voices. In that the is game. A, that's so an drives am- me nuts. Those are and, amazing. And, that's an amazing compare or uh, way to describe it. That's and, exactly and so right. I just I I it, it gives me a little bit of a a, a turn off on on uh, a lot of the voice <laughs> acting and some of the, the 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 story. But I just try to look past and just play the game. Sure, you're um, not gonna. So what you're saying is Ghost is not gonna have characters that go. Fireball, fireball, as they as they fire the fireball, and uh... it's not, I can't promise that. I think you know it's funny. Like uh, growing up, I, I yeah, you know, we're we're similar generations, right? Yeah. Like I grew up with like GI Joe and Transformers, mm-hmm. and um, it feels like Optimus Prime didn't shout out like you know <laughs> Mega Blast or you know truck truck overhaul, you know, like, and that is just the thing that like the younger cartoons. They all do that. Everybody shouts out what they're doing. Yeah. Um, we have talked about some amount of tells because I think it, it would be cool if you knew who just saved your butt. I sure. think that's the biggest yeah. one, right? Yeah. Like if you're getting, you're about to die and somebody heals you, like maybe it would be cool if like that character like sh- showed up on the screen real quick and is like, I got you or something like that. Sure. Um, and the, but the ultimate thing, I mean, I make jokes about the yelling what you're doing, but yeah. you know, that's a Pokemon thing, right? Like, that's 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 just what people are used to and i think they're one of the things we've talked about very lately we're, we're talking about it is um you have classes having like an ultimate or like a signature moment to be like i'm doing my thing right this thing that i'm so like it's you know i we talk about the iron man beam right when iron sure. man shoots his chest beam like that is what he's all about yeah, right yeah. and when hulk smashes it's it's what he's all about and it's good for us to have those like overwatch has all the ultimates that they do and and it's just like yeah he's shooting a giant serpent uh arrow and that you just know what he's about the 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 problem we're hoping to solve and we're trying to figure out the way and i feel like grand blue once again did this really well is how do you let somebody have their moment Mm. not be piled on top of everyone else's all the same time yeah 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 because grand blue it's cool right it's like it's the chain attacks it's like nope it's your turn and then it's then it's the next person and the next person they all chain together so trying to find ways to say hey this uh we've created uh let's say a, a pack of mobs or a shield on a boss and this is Sh- scott's to take care of right because if scott and brian do it it's overkill right so let's just let scott have his moment here and we can all be like that was awesome. Scott's so cool with his, you know, his his stampede of rats, rats catcher or whatever. But well, I, I could be sort of- I could be wrong here, but it feels like this is also potentially a way of decreasing toxic ra- uh, toxic issues. Like going in with a bunch of strangers into a dungeon. I mean, I, I, you know, ideally you're with your friends, but if you're with strangers, yeah. you're with pugs or whatever. Yeah. One way to help that would be 
I need you here for this cool thing you do, whether I like you or not. Like mm-hmm. I, I want you to be here. I'm glad that you just did this move. I'm glad yeah. that the I'm glad that the game forced it, maybe even because you got to yeah. time that stuff or whatever. That you know, I don't I don't know if that's come up in conversation, but my immediate reaction to what you just said is like, that's an idea. I don't know anyone else is doing as far as I yeah, know. Yeah, and 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 you know, it's funny you mentioned that. Like roles, um, kind of came up because do we want to do tanks? Do we want to do healers? Do we do nothing? You know, do and and one of the experiences we had was playing a game. I don't I don't want to poop on another game, but we played this game, and it didn't have it, healers and tanks. And it talks about it talked about personal responsibility, and, and I just felt like I played that game, and I was like, I literally don't care if anybody else is here, right? right? Like right. I can do it all myself. Don't, it's it, okay. It's great that my our damage is doubled if you're here. Kind of liked the fact that healer tank support damage whatever you you need each other right. it's it's makes you know random matchmaking or even making groups harder but there is this feeling of reliance on each other that i think is kind of important yeah um isn't the, the trick is figuring out how to do that without ep fights and yeah. you're not you're not good enough go you know kick okay wait for the next tank like those problems, which I think WoW tried to wrestle, as always, it continually wrestles with admirably, right? They try yeah. to make it better as much as they can make it better. Um, yes. it's, so it seems like a very hard problem to solve. But I, I love the idea that of both, I need you here, even if you're not awesome. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like that. Yeah, it's always, a, it's always a plus if you're around, right? It's always good to have one more. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's funny with, with WoW, I think there's, a certain amount of like the game has been around for 20 plus years or so. Right. I mean, like it's doing something right. It's got a formula yeah. people like, right. And, and as much as people can, can maybe complain about that parse culture or all that and get frustrated by it. It's like, maybe it's just, that's the game. And a lot of people seem to like it, you know, like a lot of people seem to be like, cool. We killed the boss. Now I'm going to work on parsing. And you know, that, Every game doesn't have to be that game, but WoW can be that game, and it's a game people love. I mean, it's it's rocking, it's still rocking, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and, one one would so, one would argue they're having the uh, you know right now is a bit of a crescendo. They've got kind yep, of three tiers happening, and yeah, they're having a moment. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I I feel like it's 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 very easy. I always saw this in the in the content cycle with WoW of new content comes out, everybody's excited, everything's great, we're all super happy. Okay, now it's two to three months later. The content is long in the tooth. Let's start poking holes in the systems or the balance or whatever. And then new content would come out and, you know, things would be forgotten. But that was always kind of the the narrative flow Mm. of the content cycle. And so part of it is, um, you know, like I said, I I feel like that's the nature of the game. And it's it's an enjoyable game that a lot of people enjoy. A lot of people don't. I get that. Um, but it is hard to, to pre, please uh, 10 million people, but they seem to have done a great job for as a long good, time. As good as you can do, almost. I mean, I don't know yeah, what. Yeah. And, until we see what Ghost does, you know, maybe you guys will change the whole paradigm. I don't know. but It's, it's funny. We talk about a lot, um, you know, not to, to design, because, you know, 20 years in the future. Like, if we can get, you know, if the game is, is thriving in five years, and we're like, oh, we really used up all the good ideas i i think we're all pretty happy yeah i have made a game that that could last uh and and have a good five-year run so i agree uh, um i've got a great question here from a listener this was a text that was just sent in uh 801-471-0462 you're welcome to send those anytime we also keep them for uh, future shows if needed this one says uh no name but it says uh hey really love how much you guys are communicating with the community super excited for the game how do you plan to allow players to distinguish themselves from other players during or sorry, players that are using similar roles. For example, uh, will every rat catcher play the exact same as every other rat catcher with little customization within the class itself? Um, I, I would add to this, you mm-hmm. know, if you've got a, let's say, a, a, an archer specialist and you have a magic mm-hmm. caster, the truth of it is, if you go down to the math of it, they're both ranged, they're both sending DPS this direction, uh, mm-hmm. they're both getting results from stuff. They interrupt with very different looking ways of doing things, but his interrupt is an arrow. Uh, hers is a, uh, ice blast, whatever. Yeah. Uh, 
the, but the worry is always that, well, we got a lot of homogeny going on. Are, what, mm -hmm. where's your head with that? Yeah. Two, two thoughts. One, uh, we have to, I think we need to have some sort of, uh, ability customization system, whether that's your picking abilities or you're making modifications to abilities, just this idea that my rat catcher does not necessarily have to play exactly like your rat catcher. I think when we, I was working recently, when we were working on the talent, the talent revamp for WoW, I would always make the analogy of like, when you're, you're leveling up a class, you're kind of, you're creating this little wooden statue and every level you, you chip away at it a little bit. Right. Right. And even if you're going to make your, your squirrel statue look like that person's squirrel statue, like it's still fun to be the one who makes that choice over and over again so that yours stands apart. And I think our game very similarly, we want to have some opportunity that whether it's through levels or acquisition of gear or whatever, you are shaping that character in some way. You are making some choices about the abilities that they use. I think that's really important. When it comes to inner class kind of um, balance and relationships, I do think fantasy is probably the most important thing. Some people want to be Legolas. Some people want to be Gandalf. And then they just want to feel like they're not being punished for chasing that fantasy that they enjoy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's always our job to make sure that they feel useful, that everybody feels useful, that when they go into a group, like I was always, I would always say, you know, balance is a social problem. We're, we're trying to make sure that the classes are balanced, not because we want everybody to say, you're so awesome at balancing the game, because we want them to be able to play whatever power archetype, power fantasy really resonates with them and so that's the job right that's right. the job of balancing right. and a lot of that that is a perception problem right that it's about what what everybody thinks like what the hive mind looks at the 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 ecosystem and decides that is good that is not good you get into a group is it is it um you know are you playing something worthwhile and so i think to your enchantress archer thing It'd be nice if they had uh, a couple different tools um, that they're unique, that they can feel good about. Like, oh, I brought this to the group. Like, just by making the choice of playing Dark Archer, my group gets this toy, yeah. this present, right? Whatever it is. And that feels good. But then there are certain tools that are kind of mandatory for everybody to have mm. so that it feels like, you know, they're they're useful, essentially. Right, right. right. It's also... Um tendency in some newer mmos and i cannot think of a name to even give us here that does this i think maybe it's not new but i, I think maybe uh guild wars 2 does this but there is a, a thing some mmos do where they'll say the difficulty rating of a class you're going to choose right. so you might be a star system let's say and it's if it's one star it's easy or if it's green it's easy and if it's red it's hard um to me that always struck me as a mistake and maybe I'm just wrong headed about this, but it seemed like a mistake because it, it would basically tell the player, well, I, uh, I don't want to, I mean, I'm, everyone's going right. to rip on me if I'm not good at this character. I better do the safe thing. And then what you have is a game full of the safe thing. Yeah. Uh, and then only, you know, and then, and then you also kind of artificially create a lot of people who chose the hard thing and now think they're awesome and everyone else sucks but me. And you get a real class problem, classism problem. Yeah. So is that a, a, well, I guess A, is that even on the table? And B, what, what, what's the philosophy about that within the team? I think this is, I think this is a really hard problem um, because if you're going to take on different, di higher difficulty, yeah. like you kind of want higher reward, right? Like if I'm going to play the class that is apparently more difficult to play, I, if I play it well, I want to be rewarded by being, you know, stronger. Right. Right. And I think the question is always, well, how much stronger? Like, because if it's 20%, well, people are going to be like, you shouldn't be playing those easy classes at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what, what is the gap we can create there? Because it, it is my personal opinion that if you take on extra work, you, uh, maybe I'm a capitalist or something, but like, if, you know, if you take on some extra work, you should get some extra benefit. Um, I think that is fair. And I, and I think kind of people, expect that 
but then the consequences, then somebody else is like, well, I can't do that. Mm. Either I, I'm not as that good at the game or, you know, I have uh, accessibility challenges. And so now you're basically telling me you don't get to play the game as well because socially people are pushing back and saying, oh, if you're not super up to the, you know, the high bar, then we don't want you. So I think the the compromise here is, you know, and, and, and don't get me wrong, people with, I, I know folks with accessibility challenges can perform at the highest level. Just some, I know, cannot always, right? Right. And I just want to make sure that, like, if we do create that gap, it is not a huge gap, that it's a, it's a small gap so that everybody feels like they can play the game and play it well. Right. Uh, like, that's a, a genuinely a good goal, I think. Uh, and I, yeah. as a player, I would, that's what I want out of the game. I yeah. don't want something that intimidates me the day I log in and go, ooh, there's a five-star rating difficulty on this freaking right. tank. I'm and, never and playing like, that, you know? To your, to your point, I, I feel like those... I think those are often put there to be like, well, we don't want somebody to accidentally play something sure. that is way too hard for them. And then they quit the game. Yeah, like yeah. that, I think is the general thing that that's going for. Yeah. Um, but you know, in the end it, it makes me think like, well, maybe everything's a spectrum, you know, maybe you, you, the, the stuff way over here, it's only going to appeal to a couple people. So maybe we should bring it down a little bit and just make it playable by everybody, but it's a little bit more complicated and more difficult. It's, uh, this is the, the thing where I think, you know, this is what you, you pay game designers to do, right? You got to make some judgment calls here on, uh, what, what works. The thing is, I, I you, you alluded to this with the dark souls games, you know, not every game is for everyone, right? And yeah, that's for sure. And but but you do find that some people can say this is what our game is about. It's about difficulty. It's about deliberate combat. And some people are going to be like, yes, mm -hmm. that's what I want, you yeah. know. And it's great. I'm so. I think in this day and age, we should be happy that there really is a game for everybody. But your game, any single game, doesn't have to be for everybody, right? Oh yeah. Uh, you just try to make it as for as many people as possible. Especially right um, now, there is such choice. It's never, I mean, it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of the choice we have. And you can look at all the issues the industry's having and the layoffs and the, uh, the pullback and all uh, that. Those are all real issues, right? Like big yeah. issues. But at the end of the day, it's, well, maybe it's a symptom of what I'm saying, but there's so much choice from indie all the way up to these AAA titles and everything in between. I mean, if anything, there aren't enough B titles, in my opinion. There need to be more just like yeah. fun middle middleware. But, um, but yeah, like we, it's never been, it's never been better. Um, we yeah. have a listener who asks, uh, I absolutely loved the active targeting combat system used in Terra. I don't know if that game's still around. There was talk it was going away. Anyway, yeah. uh, what are the team's thoughts about integrating some of the active targeting into a combat system? So I guess we could broaden that and say, you know, some games, uh, for example, ESO does kind of a combination. You can do mm -hmm. mainly just active third person targeting or first person but it also kind of has a way of targeting in its own way. Uh, yeah. Whereas on the other side of the spectrum, wow, and maybe games closer to like Final Fantasy, they've they've opted for more of a tab targeting system. I know that there is like nothing's off the table for you guys right now, but are you leaning mm -hmm. in any one direction? Can you even say yeah. whether you are? Yeah, no, our current direction is, um, I think like, like I said, being very close to our PC MMO family or, or, or excuse me, audience, it's, uh, but they are family. Sure. We're all family. Yeah, they're our family. Yeah. But um, we'll You're... be very similar to like, you will select a target, abilities will go to that target. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, like, I think ESO does this well, because this is kind of a, a controller issue too, where yeah. they have kind of what we, we've kind of been calling soft targeting, where, you know, you're moving... If you have a gamepad, you cannot like move a cursor around and select individual targets. So you kind of have to move the screen and the crosshair, and then it selects a target for you. And it's very similar. So we call that soft targeting, where you essentially aim at a target, and that is like your like tab target, as yeah. it would be in a WoW game. But right now we're leaning towards a you're you're clicking on a target and you're you're doing your abilities against them. Um, the the balance that we're trying to work out is a lot of you know ground-based targeting uh abilities around you 
um, those sorts of things. But we, uh, I think you'll be tagging individual targets. I think it has a, you've already said this and, you know, talking about going for more dynamic, exciting combat moments, but also keeping it within the MMO framework. Um, I think there's just a lot of room there to mine possibilities and, and to, and to, you can tab target and do it the, you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, doing it the wow way, but Mm -hmm. have those be a much more dynamic thing instead of just, I mean, that's what you guys did when, when Legion came around and Jay joined the team uh, or moved over from Diablo. It was like, we need somebody who can come in and really spice up this combat, make it look amazing while it's happening, even though really in effect, the math is the same. And uh, that seems like where you guys are headed. And that to me is, that's, that's a, that's exciting. You know, nobody wants static combat. People want some like exciting things happening, but we also don't necessarily in our MMOs want to, like you say, play a souls like and parry just on time and all that. Plus those latency issues. It's an MMO. Like there's all, there's a whole litany of technical issues. I'm sure you guys have discussed around that. Another, another game that we've taken a lot of inspiration from is uh, something called Skyforge. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. It was a Russian-developed MMO. Um, and there are... It's, it's, it's a bit of a, like... Uh, you can download it and go play it. If, oh, uh, I played play this. Free. I know what this yeah. is now. I played this once. And, yeah. and it, had, it had... There were some things that did not do well. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure they would admit that, too. But things I thought they did do well was I thought their combat was pretty interesting, right? It had kind of a, a, a tab-based soft targeting. Their melee, they had melee combos where you, you know, would kind of swing around and, and uh, do combos and kind of cleave attacks. It did some cool stuff there. And I could see us doing, like, to your point, I felt like it took that MMO combat and did some cool things with it. So we've looked at that a bunch. Uh, and gotten some some good inspiration for some ideas for us too. Were you guys bracing for trouble when you put up this milestone post up on the site? With absolutely, I, yeah. I think there was a lot of. It was a very pleasant surprise, like how well that went over. Mm. Because you know, the, I think one of the tough things is people even even you know I'm probably when I say, "Oh, we're going to have tab target type targeting," people are like, "Oh." Yeah. I was hoping it was going to be this thing. Yeah. And so it's a bit of a, you know, you could kind of create a bit of a bummer of like, oh, I had in my own head created what this game was going to be. And now it's not that. Right. Right. Uh, so that can be tough. But there's a bit of like, you know, this game looks like something, you know, people who just started making video games uh, <laughs> would make. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so you don't know how that's going to be received. And then when you're also in it every day, you're not really like judging it. You're like, okay, cool. That's our, our mannequin. Uh, that's the, the unreal mannequin that we're running around with. Right. But really, like we, like I said at the start, really it's all about answering questions. So we want to keep the team small. So we're, you know, relatively small group. And that means, you know, the, the game's not going to look great for a while. Um, and uh, so, but we're really happy that people seem to be receptive to it. Right. And, as Greg has said, if somebody wants to be like, I'll check back in in, in, in a year or so when you know things are prettier, that's fine yeah. too. But I think yeah. a lot of people maybe enjoy looking behind the curtain. Yeah, if anything, it's, it proved out your plans to be more uh, open. I mean, this shows the whole reason the show exists is this openness yeah. thing and early on stuff where you're talking about things that normally we don't hear anything about this stuff from most developers forever. And I think yeah. this just, I think people were a little prepared for that. I think this thing hit, yeah. you guys probably had all kinds of second guesses, but at the end of the day, they're like, oh, well, this is part of their transparency. And yeah. uh, interesting, I didn't realize you could use assets in an, uh, that are just sort of freely available in an engine to to test out your plans and do your stuff. And um, I think it proves out the whole idea was a good idea. I think you guys yeah. have done the right thing. I mean, who who knows in the end? Maybe by the end you'll go, oh boy, I wish we wouldn't have been so transparent. I don't know. Yeah. But I like I, you it. Know, part of it, I think, is a lot of confidence Greg has and that, you know, Nadis has been a great partner that like, hey, if we put this stuff out, we're not trying to generate excitement, right? Mm-hmm. Like this isn't about, we need to generate hype so that we can attract investors mm-hmm. or, you know, or pre-orders or something like that. That's not important right now because we we feel very secure 
in in our our state. And so we can put out things that some people are going to be like, that nah, looks like crap, moving on, you know. <laughs> and I think the the concern we have is, you know, there are games that have come out in early access that like I've played because I'm like, oh, this game's out. I'll go play it. Sure. And then I don't revisit it. Yeah. And because I, I, I favorite, I'm like, oh, then, then that game launch. Mm. Um, and I think that's, I'm more concerned about that. I think yeah. Larian did a good job with Baldur's Gate 3. Cause I'll be honest. I didn't even know it was an early access. Yeah. Like I, I, apparently people were playing that game for like a year or so, and yeah. it was getting great feedback and they made a lot of iteration and made the game better, but I didn't even know. And, and I, so I, so I think wonder, I wonder if the mistake is really hyping your early access release. Yeah. Like sometimes, like, sometimes it's almost done and you're like, wow, this is one of the best early accesses I've ever seen. This is a finished right. game essentially. But there's still a feeling of, like I do this with early, I buy a lot of early access games because I'm excited yeah. about what they're working on and I look forward to their 1.0s and, and some of them I'll even track it. But I always get a feeling of like, all right, I've had the taste. I've enjoyed yeah. what I've seen. I have no idea if they're doing a wipe. I don't know if these characters are going to stay, if my saves are there. I'm going to wait till 1.0 and I do that right. a lot. And I don't think that's what yeah. they want to have. I mean, I guess it does mean early money and it helps yeah. you know, generate whatever they got to do. But I still, I still don't know that that's the best answer. There's... There's yeah. there's some perfect way of doing that. Larian's probably the example. It's a great example of that working out really well. Um, in MMOs, well, it's a whole different bag though, right? You got all the yeah, server it's, stuff. It's funny. I know there's a lot of conversation recently about like um, early access, people paying for early access to essentially like early days, you know, before a launch. And that is really tough because you gain a lot from people trickling in mm -hmm. to a launch yeah. Yeah. you know from from a back-end standpoint like launching uh, honestly launching a, an mmo or launching an online game i i get it people are like i don't understand 100 games have done this already why is it so difficult it is every game is a unique snowflake and it is challenging and difficult and when certain companies launch uh very well um wow is a great example uh you know it it is because of a lot of 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 work and experience doing it. I was I was surprised Helldivers two got so much grace from yeah. the community yeah. for how rough things were for them, and they're they're doing awesome now. They're rocking it. But like, then another company could do the same thing, have a rough release, and it's like, f you, you guys suck, right? Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Very tough. Very tough to 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 launch games. So maybe having early access having just people kind of in the game constantly will help us have a good launch right right for the for those people who just don't want to show up until hey I, i'm not coming until it's ready and like you said my character is going to be permanent i don't want to waste time playing the game and then it goes away uh i totally relate to that yeah that's definitely again more balancing to have to figure out like how do you want to release this thing and do but i think your process is working out really well there are two questions that I want to make sure I get yep. in. These two final questions. Uh, one of them is a real question. The other one is pretty funny, but I'll read this one. Big mage guy here says an anonymous writer will ghost deliver on some frost magic. I don't know Ooh, if that's a thing magic. you can say. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm also funny. that think... guy, by the way. I love me some frost mage. So Absolutely. I, it, it's We want to do a lot of unique class. Like we talk about the rat catcher, right? Like as the kind of meme class idea. Right. Um, Honestly, we haven't settled on classes at all. Like right now we have ranged class, melee class. Th those are our classes in the game right now. Um, I think there's, I can, so I'm not going to promise a frost mage yeah. or a cryomancer or anything like that. I agree. It's a very powerful fantasy. It's something that really excites people. I think perhaps one of my own personal pet peeves is do the elements belong to the mages or the elementalists? <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and, 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 and like, you know, is this a waterbender or is it a, you know, a sorcerer Sure. and uh, would like to have kind of a clear delineation there hmm. um, and, and not have some overlap. But I, I, I totally recognize the love of, I'm just being very noncommittal here. I'm sure, sorry. Sure. Um, uh, you know, cause on one hand it's like, that's really cool. On the other hand, like everybody's done it. 
right? Yeah, so, it's a very common thing. I, I mean, here's what I'm, I'm going to suspect from you guys. It will be a unique way of doing it, but somebody's going to do some ice shit. That's it'll be some yeah, ice. It'll yeah, come out yeah, there'll be a nice person of some sort. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think you can feel good true. about that. Yeah, at yeah, some point. Yeah. Um, that's good to hear because I I love that stuff. And the last thing was somebody in the chat said this earlier and said, uh -huh. uh, Mika says Brian is forced to talk about a project ghost today and nothing about American football. Uh, he seems surprised. How does that? Uh, how do you feel about that? You want to say anything about the uh, about not talking about? Mar I I do love uh, I do love the NFL. <laughs> I do love my Buffalo Bills. They got Josh Josh's Jacks back there. Yep. Um. Yeah. No, it's okay. Don't need to talk about football. Just talk about the video game. I know that's most people follow me for the video game, not for 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 football. So that is true. Game. I like your takes on, on on when football season's in full roar. So uh, keep keep that. The only up. thing I would say that is really interesting about football is being a game designer and watching um like the competition committee every year yeah. changes the rules for NFL football. And it is always very interesting to watch that play out. Like they're they're making a huge change to the kickoff, uh, NFL kickoffs, and seeing how people fans react to that. I'm like, oh, this is all very familiar, you know. Uh, oh, they're changing something that it's been this way for 50 years. Why are you changing it? So it's 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 just funny to see that process uh, kind of happen. Um, and, yeah, you and realize kind of, it's not exclusive to gaming, is it? It's like a no, it's human. It's, it's a challenge, right? They have goals. Hey, we want to keep. We want this to be an exciting play. Let's do this, and then you know, you essentially the 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 coaches are like players where they're gonna find they're gonna find holes. Like, well, we found out how to you know make this something that we can always win with, right? Because their their objective is to win, and so they get around the rules and they win. Uh, and then they got to make another rule change. Sure. Uh, and that is that is game design 101. And I also feel like that happens in financial regulation. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're essentially, you know, uh, game designers uh, for our government, the yeah. public policy. They're trying to make rules and then people get around them and they win big. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's always interesting to watch all this thing. I, I'm a big fan of football, obviously, and, and basketball. But I also I keep an eye on economics, and it's always interesting to see the things going on there and how that feels very familiar to somebody who works in, in competitive game design. Yep. Turns out it's all made of people in the end, and we're all kind of doing the same stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. One other quick thing I wanted to make sure I didn't forget to ask today, and I know we, we you know, not a big focus on PvP today. Um, yeah. That'll, that'll come down the road. But one interesting thing that's happening in the WoW space is their decision to put out this sort of seemingly like a one-off although it sounds like it may stick around i've i've not talked to anyone internally so i don't know what their plans are but uh plunderstorm which is their uh big pvp based uh battle royale mode which kind of mm -hmm. came out of nowhere for a lot of us anyway didn't know it was coming uh it seems to really invigorate the idea of what does warcraft look like as a pvp experience mm -hmm. but not embedded in the main experience like having yeah. it be a separate thing has yeah. that or any other thinking in, uh, so far uh, around that kind of thing informed what you guys plan? Are, yeah. are you saying to yourselves, well, whatever we do, it will be embedded. That's just the way of it. Sorry, everybody, get over it. Or are you willing to look at it from that perspective of like, well, what if it was like a, I mean, it's from the same launcher, but if you're in the mood to PvP, you could go do this other kind of game type and it doesn't have to be so trapped in the same world. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are as somebody who worked on that yeah. stuff for a long time. Uh, it's funny. Did you, did you ever see Mythic Quest? I did. Yeah. I like that show. You remember the Battle Royale episode? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is my life. <laughs> uh, that, that, uh, <laughs> how did they know? Um, it, I, I'm, that's so awesome that those, for, for what it's worth, I just want to say so happy for the people who worked on that. They, they, uh, they put a lot of love and passion into it and it, it had a roller coaster, um development and it's so, it's so cool to see it's been so successful and uh people have been, been enjoying it I, I um i think the the great challenge with pvp and, and i think is the rewards system um and then like the individual class balance like thunderstorm it's it, it just plays differently right from from wow Mm -hmm. right yeah. like yeah. the controls are different and the, the bindings are different it feels like a, a very different game 
You remember while we used to have the arena tournament realm where mm -hmm. players could create whole separate characters, just get all the gear oh, and just go play. I forgot all about that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that one, one of the, for a while, like a pitch was, Hey, let's just do an arena realm and we'll have like a battle pass and players can just go play arena and work through like basically what thunderstorm did from, and you know, then you can use it in, in uh, the main game. And I think that had some appeal, but Part of it was there have been, at least my time during WoW, I can think of three separate times some individuals said, we're going to go make WoW Arena the game. Mm. They went off, they made WoW Arena the game. It kind of got a lot of WoW Arena the streamers excited for a little bit. Like, sure. oh, this is cool. This game's so great. And then it always fizzled out because it's, uh, it's very intimidating to just go in and like do a team deathmatch game that's why so many fps games have you know uh objective based modes right because it's not just about can i kill you it's am i making the right strategic decision mm. and so i think that is one thing that we'll probably focus more on um i think blue zones are a great opportunity to do something very cool and different in the pvp space yeah you know the idea that you load up a, what if we have blue zone battlegrounds and like oh you hop in and you know it's five it's it's five capture points but like this isn't playing like the last time like we've got to go find where the capture points are maybe we have to decide we're going to defend this one and uh what, you know this one is harder than we but there's no meta mm -hmm. right you have to figure it out each time um and then there's the the rewards aspect of it where whenever you have two parallel reward tracks and you can either do pve or pvp like people are going to do either pve because it's easier you always win yeah. or if we say oh it's pvp but it's 20 percent more lucrative and if that's enough to push people they will say well now pvp is mandatory i i am mad i don't want to do pvp right, so right. i think it's better to not get the same rewards from both activities mm. and so it would be better to say yeah we want pvp to be a balanced experience and we're gonna we're just gonna create that experience and create a different reward tract mm. you know you can get uh rare mounts or uh prestigious titles or there is a thing that let's say uh like a, a banner on your back that you literally can only get from pvp they don't come from pve i think that's the sort of thing you need to do is just kind of come up with unique rewards and not say like oh yeah you you get you get you can get the same thing from either it's just your preference because in my experience that just that just does not work right um so the, and then when it comes to like individual class um abilities and tuning and balancing uh, I think it's, we always fought against not trying to make the two games play completely different. Yeah. Like I'm playing my Frost Mage. I want to understand how to play it. And it's really weird when I play it very differently in the two different modes. But when they're outliers, I think it's just, it's fine to just rein those outliers in from a tuning standpoint. So those are a bunch of philosophical points and no answers about this is what we're definitively doing. Although I do think leaning into what our game, what what Ghost does extraordinarily well and unique and doing a PVP direction for that is a smart idea. I agree with that entirely. Um, well, this has been great and not nearly enough time. I, I'd forgotten how much fun it is to talk to you, but also yeah, uh, we're going to have to do this again as we get down the road and uh get into some you know you guys will get into some some further work there in the studio there will probably be plenty of time uh for us to sit down and again and talk about more specifics when it comes to class combat and everything else uh just a huge pleasure man thanks for thanks yeah for hanging Scott, with me. it was great talking to you yeah, yeah always great good to see you again. and uh greg wherever you are we hope you're safe uh <laughs> Don't eat the weird food. I don't know. Do whatever you want. You're in you're in China. You can do what you want. Uh, you're you're the man with the plan over there. Uh, but uh, we look forward to seeing him again next month when uh, we come back for our next episode. What will be and who will be on here? I don't know. Uh, but once again, uh, just Brian, a total blast hanging out with you, man. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, you too, Scott. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for listening. That's going to do it for us. If you have any thoughts, questions, or feelings, you can uh, go all over the place to do it, including fantasticpixelcastle.com. You can also go to frogpants.com slash street if you're looking for the podcast version of this show. 
And uh, keep sending us those thoughts and comments, 801-471-0462. And big thanks to today's live chat. That'll do it for us. We'll see you next time. Get more at frogpants.com. And...